bring to you the warmest welcomes of our president, the dean of the business school, Stephanie Lenaway, my department chair, Dave Close, who will be speaking next week, and Michigan State University. Not the University of Michigan. In, Mich in, in the United States, we view them as the equivalent to the evil empire. Now, when I was talking about the session, when we were introduced to the concept, before I begin, let me give you a fair warning. Number one, this is my first time to India. For all of you people who are Mumbai drivers, you have my undying admiration. <laughs> I have come to the realization that the best way for a Westerner to drive in Mumbai is to close your eyes. And let somebody else drive. That, thank you. <laughs> I needed that. The second thing I will warn you is I will try to use humor in my presentation. It's not going to be good. At Michigan State University, I was told by one faculty person that my humor is legendary. And I said, you mean funny? No, no, legendary. <laughs> so you will have to deal with that. So with that, let's begin. When I what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about a number of topics. We're going to begin by exploring the theme of this conference. Because there is more to the theme than you've heard. We're going to begin by doing something very important. We're going to define a critical concept, sustainability. What we're starting to find in business is we are now getting to the point that there are a number of key terms which are commonly used but poorly defined. And what we're starting to do is we're starting to define them. Because in defining them, we begin to understand them. And one of these themes is sustainability. Another one, which will be discussed next week, is resilience. Critical themes which are poorly used. We're going to talk about something. The theme of this conference is business, is, there a, is, there, is this a choice or an imperative? We're going to show you that in order to answer that question, you have to re-ask the question. Does it make sense? And to answer that question, you have to take sustainability and you have to understand that that's not a simple question because as we're going to show you, there are seven distinct types of sense in the concept of sustainability. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the complexities. I will be very honest with you. Sustainability is important, but it's not easy. And it's not easy because often organizations do not understand the conflicts, the trade-offs, the complexities. And the final thing we're going to do is hopefully if, now this is where I'm going to try to see if I can speak as long as I can so you have as little time for questions. <laughs> but the way the session is being timed, there should be some time for questions. Okay, so let's begin. The theme, a good theme. But let me restate it. If we look at that same theme, we have to start by understanding something very simple. What do we have to do? We have to understand what's made by sustainability. Now, so far when people think of sustainability, they think of planet. They think of pollution. That's wrong. It's not broad enough. In essence, sustainability nowadays is defined in terms of three types of sustainability and their interactions. Notice the three types, planet, pollution, resources, people. One of the things that India shows the world is the importance of the social issue. Sustainability is not an economic decision alone. It is an economic and it's a social decision, which means that you have to understand that. By the way, what's interesting is there are two types of social issues we have now. The first type, we have to look at, does it make sense to the people in India, in the various groups? You know what the second issue is? Within every group, does it make sense to the ages? We're finding out in the United States that the young people coming in have a very different set of expectations than the people who, were, who came out 10 years ago. 
By the way, there's something else here about people. It's recognizing that people are a resource. Not simply their backs, but their intelligence. I remember one of the first times I was learning with someone from Japan about lean. And the person looked at me and he said, Americans, when they draw a worker, they draw a big body and a small head. The Japanese, when we draw a worker, we draw a small body and a big head. Because people bring knowledge. And then the final issue is sustainability from a corporate or profit perspective. Now, this is increasingly important today because we're starting to understand that sustainability means the ability of the organization not simply to survive today, but to survive into the future. If you don't believe me, here's something to think about. In 1955, Fortune magazine put out the first Fortune 500, the top organizations in the world from a profit and sales perspective. In 2013, if you were to look at that same Fortune 500, you would find only 25% of the firms still there. Many firms are no longer in the same business. Many firms have disappeared. I'll give you a good example. One of the firms back there was Remington. Remington made typewriters. How many type companies do you know of who still make typewriters? You know what's ironic? The last company building a typewriter closed business and it was located in India. Guess who used it? The military. So anyway, but what's important also is the interactions. If you look at the various interactions between planet and people, you see, is it bearable? Can people live with it? If you look at the interaction between people and profit, you see the issue of, is it fair? If you look at the interaction between planet and profit, you see, is it possible? And when all three interact, is it, vi is it sustainable? Sustainability is not simply enough. Can we ensure that companies survive and thrive while also doing good? In order to do that, what I'd like you to do is to share with you a video that was created in India by a company that showed people the importance of what the thinking behind sustainability is. I didn't do anything. <laughs> it's that driver. <laughs> Climate change is a global phenomenon which we're all becoming increasingly aware of. Over the last few decades we've seen some, some real changes in the, the natural habitats. That's from rising sea levels to greater droughts and heavier monsoons. And I think this has impacted a lot of, a lot of um, individuals and families in how and where they live, in how they produce their food, in where we find our fresh water. For a healthy society, economic, environmental and social considerations are all to be worked out at the same time. And that's what is green economy. And at Kane, sustainable development forms an integral part of our business management systems. All our production operations, environment management system is accredited to the international standard ISO 14001. Operation philosophy has always been to maximize our renewable resources. The Mangala Terminal 
re recycles all produced water, injected water. We adopt sustainability as a key strategy to bring about social inclusion as well as help safeguard the environment. We fully respect the community's right to the natural resources. I think it's important that we all consider green economy on a personal level and then move that up to a company level. After office hours, all the electricians have been briefed to switch off all the lights, unused lights, remove all the electronic equipments and gadgets from their workstations. Light off करना इसलिए जरूरी है क्योंकि कई employee करते हैं जो light on करके चले जाते हैं. इसलिए off कर देते हैं ताकि इसे बिजली कपत कम हो. With the introduction of the recycled paper, we have stopped the cutting of 42 trees every month. Usage of those paper cups are really high, almost like in thousands every day. So right now we are using ceramics instead of paper cups. I just to imagine that the energy or the environmental footprint is also a monetary value that you have in your pocket. How would you spend it? Going forward, successful companies will be those companies who accept these concerns and who adopt green policies and a green approach, not because they are told to, but because they genuinely believe that's the right thing to do. What's interesting about that presentation is a comment that's made by the gentleman. And he asked the question, can you put a monetary value on it? And that's one of the things we're going to think about. Now, let's go back and ask the question, is this a business choice or is this a business imperative? In order to do that, you have to look at one thing. Can you make a compelling business case for sustainability? It is the concept of the business case that is important. If you cannot make a compelling case for sustainability, it is a requirement, it is law, it is what you have to do. But when you make a compelling case, then you say it is something we must, we should, we will do. But what do we mean by making a business case? Because one of the things I find when I work with companies in sustainability, I always ask them to develop a business case. What do we mean by a business case? Well, to have a business, compelling business case, there are four traits you have to have. Number one, is it valid? Does it address a real problem? Can you show people that there is a need for action? Number two, is it feasible? Can you do it? Do you have the resources? Do you have the commitment? Do you have the people's involvement? Is it defensible. Can you provide people with a strong argument that says this makes sense? You know what I'm going to tell you something? If you do sustainability correctly, it is always defensible. In many cases, it's because of the overhead. And finally, and this is what's interesting, is it acceptable to the people inside? <coughs> if you cannot do something which is acceptable, people will ignore you. Where I learned this is I was working with a company and we were teaching them lean systems. And they were very successful in the previous system. And we showed them the advantages of the new system we had them work through. We walked away and we saw something. The people listened politely, nodded their heads, and then they said, those are professors, they don't know what they're doing. And then they went right back to what they were doing before. We didn't make a compelling reason. So what? Well, Business cases can be built at several levels. Number one, it's required to do. 
The law says if you don't, you will go to jail. No argument. That's a hard one to sell. By the way, I'm going to make something to you. Most people, when they focus on operations, they focus on cost savings. I had a chance to speak with someone from Harley Davidson who was the chief procurement officer. By the way, he, he was not happy. I'm a motorcyclist in the States and I drive a BMW. And he looked at me and says, you know, there's only two types of people in the world, those who ride Harleys and those who wish that they should. And I said, you've got it half right. There are those people who ride Harleys and there are those people who know better. <laughs> anyway, the point he said is, you know what the problem with cost savings are? You've made a bad decision in the past, and guess what you're doing? Correcting it. By the way, cost savings occur at three levels. Within the department, within the firm, within the supply chain. And you have to think of those three levels. Then there's a second element. Where did I learn cost avoidance? Toyota. If you walk through the aisles of Toyota, they have a big sign that says, P is greater than S. What do you think the P stands for? And I'll give you a hint, it's not profit. By the way, I'm an American, I'm a Canusian, I'm a Canadian American. I was born in Canada, but I also have dual citizenship, which means the American government considers me American, the Canadian government considers me confused. <laughs> anyway, if you go there, what do you think the P stands for? And it's not profit. Pe no, it's not people. It's not production. No, it's prevention. Prevention always exceeds savings. Let's not make a mistake and then correct it. Let's avoid making the mistake in the first place. Then there's one more level. Can it help us generate revenue? Can it help us achieve a strategic advantage in the marketplace? That's the highest level. That is where you start getting top management. And then finally, you have to recognize that Banking a business case is both a social and an economic process. Both have to be considered. Then I said, but you know, therefore, if we want to make a business case, it has to make sense to us. Then my wife looked at me and says, what do you mean by making sense? By the way, you're going to see one of my problems in class. I walk around a great deal. I believe a moving target is a hard one for students to hit. Anyway, one of the things that we saw is that there are not one, but there's seven types of senses we're going to touch on. What's the first one? We're going to talk about the legal. I've thrown up here some examples of some of the legal imperatives that are present. For example, if you take a look at, which one is that? Okay, do I have a pointer? No, I don't have one. If you take a look at the, the lower left, that's the lead building program in the States. If you take a look in the middle, you have the Indian, one of the Indian building programs. If you take a look at the lower right, you have something from Miramar. If you look at the ISO 14000, that's from China. The purpose of this is to say right now, companies, organizations, countries across the world are looking at sustainability. And there are different types of initiatives. We have government. We have semi-mandatory. We have mandatory. We have voluntary. Good example is... The McDonough group has the cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach for product design. Here's something to think about. If you, are, if you sell anywhere, domestically or internationally, be prepared to deal with environmental issues. Here's the reality. They're growing exponentially. If you were to look at the number of pages of environmental regulations, they are growing between 2.5% to 3% exponentially per year. What's the second issue? They're often inconsistent, both internally and between. Now, the reason I have the EPA there is I was once asked to be on a panel group for how the Environmental Protection Agency could improve sustainability in the States. And we had a firm, a software firm, which said, it is easier for us to develop an environmental system for Europe with all of its different languages than it is for the United States. How's that? Well, in the United States, we have 50 states, one district, the District of Columbia, and we have the government. We have at least 52 different sets of regulations, and they're often at conflicts with each other. 
It is dynamic, it's changing, it's politically driven, which means it's driven by symptoms. And often what we're finding is compliance is not enough because the standards are changing. So what? And then internationally, there's a question of which ones to use. So therefore, if you ignore sustainability, you have to deal with the fact that it makes legal sense. Okay. So what? What is else? By the way, I had to put this picture up. First time I come to India, in Mumbai, I look at someone and I say, tell me, why are the helmets on the motorcycle? <laughs> I mean, the motorcycle doesn't need protection. Why aren't they in the heads of the drivers? In the States, I have to wear a motorcycle helmet because it protects my head, supposedly because my head is valuable. And the person said, we have to understand what happens is when they see a police officer, they take it off and put it on, and as soon as the police officer is gone, they put it back off. That's the problem with compliance. It's a constraint. You do enough to satisfy the letter of the law, not the spirit. So that's why. And therefore, it becomes a constraint, not an opportunity. And there's another way to look. OK, that's one sense, legal. What's the other sense? Let's talk about India. India is a fast-growing demand. You, you lack critical resources, energy clean water, others. There's an increasing emphasis on manufacturing. You have what is intriguing, one of the best developed service economies I've ever seen. Yours is an economy where everything is delivered to the person. You don't shop per week like we do. You shop daily. All of that requires resources. Now let's look at manufacturing, for example. Why do you think I have an iPhone up there? What is one of India's strategic thrusts to become a power technologically in, the, in new technologies? Information. By the way, why is there a glass of water up there? Here's something to think about. Why the cell phone? The cell phone is up there because cell phones and other high technology uses what's known as rare earth elements. Take a look at all of those statistics. What is that telling you if we're going to become an economy focusing on cell phones, computers, advanced technology? What's that telling you? A lot of the elements we need are not going to be there. How about water? One of the challenges India has is water. Here's the irony. I live in Michigan. Michigan is the sort site of the Great Lakes. One-seventh of the world's fresh water is in that area. I take water for granted. In India, water is a scarce resource. How about there's less available, there's greater demand. How about even manufacturing? Levi Strauss decided to get away from using cotton, which was grown using chemical pesticides to organic cotton. You know what they found out? Guess what the biggest problem they have with genes is? washing them and getting them ready for production. You know why? They use 30, they use 3,000 liters of water to make one pair of jeans. Why sustainability now? There's greater competition. Here's something else to think about. You not only have competition from internally in India, you have competition from other countries. You also have the fact that it's being needed to build both infrastructure and systems and products. For example, think about China. Right now, China has an average growth per year of 15%. Look at what their, th what their demand for steel is. They currently consume 40% of all the world's steel production. Here's something else to think about. I had a friend of mine who lived in China for a while. She, her name is Linda Sprague. And she said if China was to build all of, take all of the resources it would need to really build its infrastructure, it would consume 100% of the steel production and 100% of the concrete production. So there's competition. So what does that mean? Supply is less than demand. In order to live in that environment, you have to do two things. Change demand or change supply. So. You have to think about things in the following. 
this is a great thing. What I'm starting to find companies looking at is sustainability is a chance for them to rethink how they do things. Albert Einstein once said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again the same way and expecting the same resu different results. It's a chance for us to rethink things. So, resource, so sustainability makes sense from a resource perspective. Well, here's something to think about. If you take legal and you take resource, it's you gotta do it. It reminds me of my children. Is there another sense? Yeah. I'm gonna, okay, this is a quiz. You thought you're gonna sit here and listen. <laughs> Foolish people. Okay, in most organizations, not world class, but most organizations, what is the relationship between one unit of value and non-value? That is, for every one unit of value, how many units of non-value do you generate in terms of time, cost, or whatever? Is it A, 1 to 10, B, 1 to 100, C, 1 to 200, or D, 1 to 1,000? All right, all, no, time out. We're going to do this. Okay, I'm the keynote speaker. I ask the questions. <laughs> Please be nice. Okay, all of those who think it's A, put up your hands. Two people. Okay, thank you. All of those who think it's B, put up your hands. More. All of those who think it's C, put up your hands. All of those who think it's D. And the answer is? It's D. That's why it's circled. It's one to a thousand. Now think about that. Just think about that. For every one unit of value, you are creating 1,000 units of non-value. I was working with an insurance company in the United States. It took them three weeks to process a policy. In that three weeks, they had a solid 21 minutes of work. What is this? Why is this so important? It's important. Let me give you where this was really driven home to me. I heard this statistic in 1999, and I thought to myself, that's silly. So what happened? I started working with the Masco Group, uh, Bear Paint, um, Delta Faucets, Hans Groyer, which is advanced showering and bath systems in Germany. I'm still trying to convince them to give me one of their high-end items, and they won't do it for free. And also companies like uh, Merillat cabinets and, uh, sorry, uh, Milgard windows. We have now done over 350 projects with managers. In the 350 projects, what we found is we asked the accountants at Masco to give us an idea of the relationship between costs, what was the payback? They expected initially a 50% payback over one year. What do you think the actual payback was? over 300 projects. And what's that? How many of you think we met 50%? How many think you we didn't? How many think we did more than 50? How many people think we did 100% or more? Oh, you people, you don't get it. 630%. How many of you would invest in something that gives you a 630% payback per year? In fact, the last project we did had 28 students, managers, on a million dollar investment, Masco generated $14.5 million in returns. That's the, dis that's the advantage. That's one reason companies who are doing sustainability now recognize there is a relationship between sustainability and lean. Sustainability is good for you if it's done correctly. Why? Because pollution is simply a form of waste. By the way, as soon as you do that, you start thinking about waste. And by the way, here's something to think about. Henry Ford, very important to Michigan, is the person who developed the best idea of, sustain of waste. What he said back in 1914, is waste is anything that doesn't contribute to value. In fact, to give you an idea of how he did this, this is the Model T Ford. Henry Ford was not only, did he not only specify 
the components. He specified the boxes in which the components were shipped. Why do you think he did that? And if you didn't build the boxes correctly, he would send back the entire shipment. Why? Uh, packaging and opening up takes time. Yeah, not only that, he did something else. You, you're, yes. Oh, don't do that. I'm supposed to be the keynote. I'm supposed to know the answers. Okay. You know what he did? He took the packaging, the boxes apart, and they became the floorboards in the Model T car. That's complete usage of resources. By the way, we know from over 20 years of working with lean that there's seven forms of waste. By the way, I'm going to make a statement. Waste is not a problem. Waste is a symptom. It tells you that there's something wrong in the system. It doesn't tell you what. It tells you that there is. By the way, do you know something? You know, people are saying for, for this, they're saying that there's another type of waste. Knowledge. So, by the way, what's interesting is if you go online, you can look up Accenture and they will tell you how Tatum Steel has introduced successfully Lean and Six Sigma into their systems in order to reduce waste. So therefore, waste makes economic sense. By the way, that's a key hook for managers. Think of it. One to a thousand. Why is it companies aren't aware of that? You know what the answer is? They've never thought about it. It's tradition. They've always done it that way. Lean is the time to give us a chance to re-examine. Okay. By the way, it would be remiss of me not to talk about supply chain. After all, Michigan State University is one of the top two schools in the United States in supply chain. And we're proud of it. So I have to talk about it. Okay? I remember I told you my humor was not good. You're starting to find out. That's why I tell my classes they have to... S laughing is part of their class participation. That's good. Thank you. I'm being insulted by the panelists. Anyway, why do we talk about supply chain? Well, let me talk about the supply chain. The supply chain is important. What companies like Tata, what companies, other companies in the United States, in India are recognizing is that the supply chain is a critical component of how we compete. Notice what it does. It's the new basis. It's not us. It's our supply chains. More importantly is that the supply chain brings capabilities and capacities. It builds things that it can and cannot do. It brings the ability to respond quickly. Notice something else. Their supply chain is expertise. It's knowledge. Fourth thing, in many cases, for example, if you're in the auto industry, I look at Audi, and Audi advertises that they have Herman, they have, uh, look at their stereo system. It's developed by someone else, Harman. That's because of the reputation. You buy a computer from Dell, and it's Intel inside. Reputation. We can want to develop close relationships closer relationships, and if we use the supply chain correctly, we can reduce cost, we can reduce lead times, we can improve quality. Yet, you are no better than your supply chain. What does that mean? Apple has a problem. It sources the iPad through Foxcom out of China. How many of you have ever seen Foxcom? How many of you know that Foxcom, for their dormitories for their workers, has suicide netting? You see it, and it's like, wow. You know, you, they make it, this one person put to me, we do it so it makes it hard for the person to kill themselves. And I'm going, really, I needed to know that. How about the body shop? Several years ago, they found that one of their suppliers was using animals in their testing. That reflected back on the body shop. How about Nike? Nike is concerned because its customers, which are located primarily in North America and Europe and China, Japan I should say, want products which are done fairly. And yet, on the third tier supplier, you'll find that they're using child labor. That, that echoes back in them. Or, how about a success story? McCormick's. 
McCormick's is one of the world's largest spice manufacturers. You know what they're doing now? They're recognizing that their ability to generate spice is a function of their ability to have a sustainable source of supply. They went into Uganda and they took subsistence level farmers and they developed a system whereby they could have a living wage, keep their children at home and in school, and make money. By the way, what works in Uganda does not work elsewhere. Well, it's issues like visibility. It's issues such as fair trade within our supply base. Supplier develop By the way, I want to talk about supplier development. And we have to worry about issues such as measurement, reward, and problem solving, things we can worry. By the way, one of the things I want to hit on is that look at our measurement system. Often, we don't measure our people for sustainability. We measure them for cost. By the way, here's something to think about. It's a trivia question. I'm going to talk a lot about metrics. When I talk about metrics, what differentiates a metric from a measure? Are they the same thing? I'll give you a hint. The answer is not yes. It's a double negative. It's improper English, I know, but I'm American. Besides, because I'm Canadian-American, I'm rude, but I'm polite about it. <laughs> anyway, here's the point. A measure is a number. A metric is a measure. It's a standard, and it's a consequence. Measures are informative. Metrics are critical. What are metri why are metrics so critical? They're not critical for, for control purposes. They're critical for communication. If you measure something, what are you telling people? It's important. If you don't measure it, what are you telling? It's not important. So we have to manage something else, the trade-offs. Now, I'm going to bring up the trade-offs because sustainability is not easy. Here's why it's not easy. There's, on the left-hand side is CFL, compact fluorescent light. On the right-hand side is an incandescent light bulb. Which is more sustainable? Ah, time out. Don't say that. You jump too quickly. Here's the reality. I see if you measure in terms of energy requirements, guess this, which one is more sustainable? <coughs> CFL. What happens if you break a CFL? Mercury. What's the problem with that? Disposal. Okay, now you see the problem, trade-offs. To manage supply chain, you have to be willing to deal with the trade-offs. And that's something we have to deal with. By the way, you know what the answer is? It depends on how you define sustainability. Energy, the answer is clear. Earth, the answer is clear. Okay, let me talk about one other issue, which is the fact that when we look at the supply chain, this aspect, and we're looking at the upstream supply chain, our suppliers, we have to look at the fact that we have to develop our suppliers. What does that mean? We have to have what's known as a supplier-based management strategy. And that's going to have four elements. What's the first element? Management of our major, our current suppliers. We have to develop our minor suppliers. Why? They're the future. We have to develop them, evaluate them, integrate them, educate them, improve them, diversify them. We have to scout. What's scouting? Three things. Identifying potential suppliers, making ourselves look attractive, and scouting the competition supply chains. Finally, we have to manage firms up and down, from a scouted to a minor, from a minor to a major, from a major out. By the way, you know what this means? If you want to be sustainable, you have to make it something that you plan for. You have to develop the systems. By the way, there's also the issue of which environmental standard. And finally, there's credibility. I spent a lot of time, I'll have you know, looking for a sign like the one that you see there. Did you see what the sign says? Do as we say, not as we do. That's the challenge of sustainability. If you're going to ask your suppliers to be sustainable, you have to be sustainable. So from that perspective, it has to make supply chain sense. By the way, I'm going to share with you something which I think is really amazing. In the last five years, there has been a significant change in how firms 
think about themselves. And the way that they think about themselves is they now start to talk about a different way of thinking about strategy. Let me show you what they're thinking of. Their people is the basis of modern competition. It's the business model. Notice what the business model has, four elements. Who's your key customer? Every business model is targeted to a key customer. Number two, what's your value proposition? By the way, the key customer recognizes something critical. Not all customers are equally important. Every key customer has to be recognized because you want to make yourself attractive. Number two, what's the value proposition? Value propositions have four traits. Number one, is the customer willing to pay for it? Before we go any further, how many of you can operationally define value? Anyone here? I'll give you something to think about. There are three traits of operational definition of value. Ready? What's the first? The customer's willing to pay for it. The customer's not willing to pay for it, guess what? Not value. Number two, it's got to satisfy corporate strategic and financial objectives, which is one reason IBM got out of the ThinkPad business. Number three, it's got to differentiate us. Number four, it's got to be supported by the capabilities. So you've got those four things. Then you have the third element, capabilities. What can and can't we do? What goes in there? Operations, accounting, supply chain, the C word, culture. Why is that so important? Because the business model says, when what the key customer expects, what we promise, and what we can deliver are in sync, we can outcompete anyone else. Why is that so important? Well, it's important because it enables us to compete on different levels. Most of the time, we think about faster, better, cheaper. How about identifying customer needs which are poorly met? Or how about identifying customer needs which are not well met, currently met? If you don't believe this, I'm going to ask you to think of there's a company called Tesco which has gone into South Korea and it's identified as its key customer, the young professional. And guess what it's done? It's introduced the, to these young professional in Korea, you would have to go off and spend time shopping. How many of you go off and love to shop? It's fun, isn't it? Guess what they've done? In South Korea, if you go in the subway, you take your smartphone. In the subway, there are pictures of Tesco uh, shelves. You scan the code, put it into your basket, and if you place the order between, before 1 p.m., it arrives at your home by 5. That's a business model. Okay, so what? This is good, better, but this is best. Okay, the new changing realities are simple. In the past, it was company against company. Now it's becoming supply chain against supply chain, and now it's moving into business model against business model. By the way, talking about business models, I'm going to make a couple of other points. Okay, what has this got to do with India? Nothing, but it's, it's a good picture. I was in 2010, I was in... University of Virginia, and I was talking with the first American commander to be in Haiti, Port-au-Prince, after the earthquake. She was a Coast Guard commander. You know what she said to me? We had a problem. When I got into Haiti, I was told by my commander to render all dual assistance to the people of Haiti, to the civilian authority. The civilian authority said, I want, 100, I want 150 armed shore patrol people. Why? To protect everything. You know what the problem she had? If she was to obey that requirement, she would strip out all of the protection from the east coast of the United States. So guess what? Good news is Haiti is protected. Bad news, we're not. She said, you know what the problem with that? And this is the, this is the reason why I'm going to introduce this. The problem is there is a difference between being output-driven and outcome-driven. Output is 150 armed shore patrol people. Outcome-driven is... I need to provide protection on a 24-7 basis for food, water, shelter, medicine, and energy. What's the difference between being output and outcome? 
Output is specific. Notice, there is always one outcome and one way of doing it. But with outcomes, I allow the supply chain to help me identify new opportunities. Here's the point I'm trying to raise. If you're going to do sustainability through the business model, don't focus on the solution. Focus on the outcome. Define it well and let the people help you get there. When we look at outcomes, here's something to think about. Business models understand that there are six fundamental outcomes. We mix and match. What are they? Cost, responsiveness, security. Security is important in drug, the military, and food. Sustainability. Resilience. What to deal with with supply chain disruptions. And innovation. By the way, all firms offer some degree of mix of those. So what? Well, in the past, we thought of outcomes as being one outcome. We're going to compete on cost. You know what the advantage of that is? Number one, it's, you can be the best at it, but, and it's also the most attractive, but it's the highest risk. You know why? What happens if the customer doesn't want that anymore? So what we're starting to see is outcomes need to be blended, which means we have to understand that we put things together. We blend things. By the way, when you blend things, understand that some blends don't work. Innovation and cost do not work. Did you know that? I'll give you an example. Uh, innovation, radical innovation, requires us to have slack. Why? Slack for innovation, slack for debugging, slack for failure. In the United States, I'll give you an example. Somebody came up with the idea of making a hot dog out of tuna. Didn't fly. Slack for home runs. What does lean say? No slack. You need slack. You need to have different people looking at the same thing differently. What does lean say? One way. And by the way, this is what happened to 3M. They tried to do that, and they tried to do Six Sigma and innovation, and it didn't work. So we have to prioritize. How do we prioritize? We use one, two, three. One of the outcomes is critical. Two of the outcomes are important. You're in the top 20%. Three of the outcomes are necessary. You know what's important about this? You cannot ignore sustainability. One way or the other, it's got to be in your business model. Why is it? Because it offers us a way of differentiating. It, makes, it gives us ways of describing ourselves in rich strategic ways. And it creates strategic solutions. So business becomes important. By the way, if you combine cost, supply chain, and business model senses, we get we want to. There's a, there's a reason. By the way, to give you an idea, here's what Puma did in Bangalore. 